Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to uh, part two of our deep learning, what you need to know. And I mentioned before how we've developed algorithms, and I won't go into this, but we've developed this course to find algorithm which helps find the pancreas within the abdomen without any user interaction. And this novel 3D course to find framework uh, tackles the ability to detect the pancreas. And we do it in 3D, which is more difficult but has much more success and it's the technique that has the highest accuracy of anything that's been published we also look at shape and geometry and this is important for detecting lesions by the uncinate and tail of pancreas we develop this recurrent saliency transformation network the core segmentation segmentation stage is connected to the fine segmentation via transformation layer the coarse and fine segmentation networks can be optimized jointly, and the coarse segmentation mass can help with fine segmentation. And in this article that's in press now, it allows us to really uh, have a multi-stage visual information throughout the iterations to improve the segmentation accuracy. And we're continuing to develop along those lines. Now we also are putting a lot of effort into radiomics and many other articles showing this as well. Radiomics is interesting. It's the high output uh, extraction analysis of quantitative features for medical images. It's been around for a while, but now it's taking on great interest. It looks at the CT scan as if you were looking at it through a microscope and looking at the zeros and ones. We look at signal intensity and shape and texture. And people are now showing how you can use this for both diagnosis and prognostication. If you look at tumors, they're spatially heterogeneous structures. We look for these changes to create signatures and fingerprints. And once the radiomics creates this imaging data into this fingerprint, you can detect other tumors. And it's very impressive. It's an emerging field for machine learning that allows for conversion of radiologic images into mineable high dimensional data. And in this article uh, from uh, Park, talking about how this can be used for diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive accuracy, that is indeed very impressive. So not only potentially can you predict and detect a pancreatic tumor, but determine the best chemotherapy and determine the patient's subsequent outcome. Now, from a mathematics perspective, radiomics is first order shape, second order, and high order statistics. First order is the simplest, the distribution of values of individual voxels, histogram-based methods, mean, median, maximum, minimum, uniformity, entropy, skewness, and kurtosis. And you can see just on this diagram the various ways you can look at images and how you develop the signature. You then look at shape be it through compactness or maximum 3D diameter, the spherical disproportion, sphericity, surface area, surface to volume ratios, and volume. And then you look at second order statistics, which are gray level co-occurrence matrices, gray level run length matrices, for example, and higher order, where you can impose multiple different filters to accentuate variation, to accentuate key findings. And as you pass through this, it becomes a very important way of being able to think about how we look at information. And so that becomes really, really important to us. Our work is shown in this graph. You can see from the input through feature extraction, through analysis, to classification. And as I mentioned, we're looking at it and other people are looking at it at all different levels within the map. We initially looked at 478 features on normal and abnormal cases, adenocarcinoma versus normal pancreas. And we found that the lesions were different. They had signatures of cancers, and you could separate cancer from non-cancer. And we found that 40 radiomics features really gave you all the information you need. And you could see the overall accuracy was over 99% with 100% specificity. And the top five features gave you in the mid-90s or low 90s, so texture, shape, wavelengths. But obviously, you want to be at 99%, so you need to have all 40 features. And we just published this. Linda Chu, Sian Park, wrote this incredible article talking about CT radiomics features 
in pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And there were some conclusions in there that we were able to, with quantitative analysis of the imaging features, offer the potential for computer-aided diagnosis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And you could see from the conclusion, radiomics features extracted from whole pancreas can be used to differentiate between CT cases from patients with adenocarcinoma and healthy subjects. That is indeed impressive. And yes, our average size was about four centimeters, but this seems to work even with smaller tumors as well. And it's something that indeed is very, very exciting. And as if you looked and go forward with this type of data, you can imagine now what you would be able to do. Use radiomics to say tumor, no tumor, and then use the deep learning algorithms to find where the tumor specifically is. So now it's not that radiomics sits there by itself, but the AI, the individual program we developed, the saliency network for finding the pancreas works out very nicely. And again, we also want to look at other things. So can you look at this for neuroendocrine tumors? Can you look at this for um, patients who have neuroendocrine tumors? What specifically can or can't you look at? And in fact, we've had really good results looking at that. And now the, there is a potential to combining this algorithm with automated organ segmentation for automatic detection of pancreatic cancer. So we're getting to the point of what would be optimal. The computer could detect everything, and the radiologist might then be the second reader and the dictator and collect the money. Life is good. Now, there are limitations. All of our scans from a single vendor, though over many years and multiple machines, you got to make certain that translates. We also had very strict protocols at Hopkins. We have for years. Not everybody follows the protocols correctly. So we'll have to see how well we can do. And then you go further. What about versus pancreatitis? What about autoimmune pancreatitis? What about neuroendocrine tumors? What about serous cystadenomas? Well, what about it? Well, we're now working on neuroendocrine tumors versus adenocarcinoma. We know some of the features. We know they're vascular neuroendocrine and adenocarcinoma is typically hypovascular. But when you start looking at the radiomics, they do have different appearances and different signatures. And there have been several articles now from beyond Hopkins looking at differentiation not only of the tumor versus normal versus pancreatic adenocarcinoma, but looking at grading tumors. Because as we pick up incidental tumors now, we need to operate in everybody. If we knew the grade, we could then perhaps simply follow the patients. And so there are a number of articles that basically have looked at this. And you could see that, okay, canalis, entropy was predictive of grade two and three tumors and progressing free survival. Char body, texture-based features achieved in accuracy uh, and of 0.74 and shape-based features, 0.7, separating class one and two from G3. Okay, and in this article by Gu, they have a, a normative normogram to predict precisely what the tumors are. Low risk, high risk, maybe the grade ones you won't have to take out if they're incidental findings. So what precisely do you need to do? That's gonna be great questions. And so Gu makes the point. Radiomic signature, a strong discriminatory ability for this logic grade of neuroendocrine tumors. Arterial and venous phase imaging are complementary for predicting uh, staging of the neuroendocrine tumors. And the comprehensive normogram outperformed clinical factors in assisting therapy strategy in these patients. So again, we're hitting on all three points. And this work from Chugin talked about Texture parameters have potential to grade neuroendocrine tumors as well. And this was his chart, but you're able to do that. Now, another problem we have, and again, we want AI just not to do stuff. We want to do stuff that we have problems. Autoimmune pancreatitis is hard to diagnose. People don't think of it. it presents like cancer, looks like cancer. Obviously, autoimmune, you treat with 40 milligrams of steroids for 14 days and it's done. You have a mass net of the pancreas, and you do a Whipple's, you just did a Whipple's for an AIP. We'd like to prevent that. What can we do? The problem is AIP, both imaging-wise and technically, can look the same. Patients that would join this, elevated CA-19-9, pancreatic mass. Obviously, 
you, you, you would like to make that diagnosis. We never knew what autoimmune pancreatitis was. It was always a path diagnosis. Now we know. But you can see it's less than half the time anybody thinks about it. Once people think about it, even then we did a study, and 75% of people at best call it correctly. But look at the radiomics. We're over 95%. And this is an article we're submitting today. Literally, you're able to predict and separate autoimmune pancreatitis from normal. Okay, that's easy. But autoimmune from pancreatic cancer, 95% accuracy. That's incredible. And that should be published soon. What else? What about pancreatic cystic lesions? Okay, detection, not going to be a problem. But can you distinguish between the various lesions, the leave-alone lesions versus the lesions that need biopsy or removal? That would be ideal with a random forest classifier. We talk about cyst classifications, and you could see three of them here. And mucinous cyst adenoma, middle of the body of the pancreas, middle-aged female, maybe occasionally calcification, IPM small, cyst attached and not attached to the duct, serous cyst adenomas, variable appearance, stretching of vessels, central calcification, multiple septations, larger. But we, we're not always perfect. Then also in IPMN, can you distinguish high grade from low grade? Low grade, you may do nothing. High grade, you do a Whipple's procedure. You do surgery. Well, there's been a series of articles, and here are eight of the articles that speak about this that radiomics can aid in differentiation of IPMNs with high-grade versus low-grade dysplasia. So that indeed becomes very, very important. There's an article by Cheng Impressed, Unresectable Pancreatic Cancer, the Role of Quantitative Imaging Features and Biomarkers for Predicting Outcomes. And in this article, Cheng and his team found the pre-treatment CT quantification of imaging biomarkers from texture analysis associated with a progression-free survival and overall survival in patients with unresectable pancreatic adenocarcinoma who were treated with chemotherapy in the combination of pretreatment texture, parameter features, and later features. So again, you can see detection and classification and management are all being put together in this realm. And in this article, they looked at CT texture parameters, mean level gray, standard deviation, entropy, mean of positive value, skewness, kurtosis, all things we look at and we're able to get really, really good results. And in the article, again, the ability using pre-chemotherapy pre texture to predict outcome and predict the best therapies. And there's been several articles about this treatment response predicting, some from MD Anderson, from, from Brigham and Women's Hospital, but you can see that it's the same parameters. So now, detection, management, and outcome. We talk about patient survival. We finished second in the contest. Sian Park finished second at the big computer meeting last year predicting outcome, looking at the scans, and then looking at CAA 19.9. But again, we think that this is gonna be critical, but we know also that there are being many different features that you'll have to know about you're not going to just look at the images alone. You'll have the patient age. Maybe you'll have the CA199. That alone could be helpful. Here's an example what it does with radiomics and the Brennan scores. You're doing much better than just doing a Brennan score, for example. So, again, as we move forward, how are we going to use the multiple baskets of information? And oncology is working on changing what information they can provide. Pathology is looking to change what information they can provide. And if everyone's changing stuff, we're going to have a lot of new information. And this idea of predicting is very, very important. There's a series of articles, and here's just a, a dozen articles talking about patient survival and how the studies were done differently. But you could see lots of variability. And we want to make certain that whatever we do, it's going to be consistent that you could take it from hospital to hospital and center to center without things falling apart because of some unknown variables. And tumor hypoattenuation and heterogeneity are associated with poor survival. So again, the chronic tumors do poorly. But again, there's many things we're going to look at. We can look at treatment response, how patients do post-treatment. Uh, will that be? Chen looked at things, adenocarcinoma, analyzed the CT obtained during radiation therapy planning, looked at different parameters in that regard. And you could see that, of course, 
The challenge I mentioned before, and you cannot overlook it, in radiomics, there's no standard definition of how to acquire studies, even within the same vendor. And whether it's acquisition or reconstruction protocol or segmentation or features or statistical analysis, there are many things we have, but radiomics can be affected by any of these. And that's a concern because if I have one scanner and I change the scanners, will everything still work or will I need to restart from scratch? And whether it's the slice thickness, reconstruction filters, voxel size, gray levels, radiation dose, all of those things become critically important to us. And I think that's the point. If you really want to do this thing well, you have to really understand precisely what exactly it is that's going to happen and then adjust accordingly. So with that, let's take a break and let's come back and we'll finish part three in uh, just a few minutes. And if you have any questions, save on to them or put them on CTSS or ask me and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks very much. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website ctss.com for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.